we're, we're really lucky to have Dan. We're lucky to have Dan on our <coughs> advisory board, and we're lucky to have Dan's input for this very controversial topic that we have to deal with while we're here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Anne. And so it's a pleasure and a privilege to be to be talking to you. Um, Anne had first suggested that what I talk about tonight is um, the question of whether or not there is a possibility for some kind of international understanding or accord on embryo research and stem cells in particular. And I, I, that topic appealed to me because um, of a bit of my history that I'll, I will fill in a little bit of detail about. Um, I was teaching at the University of Wisconsin when Jamie Thompson uh, was doing his original work with stem cells. And he told the university um, uh, that he had basically done the work and uh, that he had gotten the signal that from science that it was going to be published and that the university should be on notice that this is going to be a really big deal. So the university uh, was, on, on the one hand, delighted that they knew they were going to be put on the map by this. And uh, on the other hand, they were scared because they thought there may be something in here that's going to get us nailed to the wall. So they, they appointed a, a bioethics advisory committee, and, uh, which I was on. And basically, they told us, uh, we want you to go over this from one end to the other and see if there's anything here that has to be changed before it goes public um, so that you know, we, we won't uh, really get hit. And uh, Jamie, is an, uh, some of you know, is an extremely methodical person. Um, he had, he had uh, bent over way backward to make sure that there was absolutely no US government support for his work, to the point of changing clothes so that no molecules would adhere to his uh, work, work a day uh, attire when he crossed the street over to his government-funded lab, um, and, and so on. So, Really, there wasn't a whole lot to change. We, I think we made some recommendations about the, the connection with Geron that, um, that were followed, but um, we were able to tell the university, you really don't have too much to worry about as long as you articulate your case well, which I think that they did. Now, having um, just been through it, um, I was then invited to WHO, and I went over there, and I said, hey, everybody, listen, this incredible thing has happened, the stem cell business, A, and B, um, WHO could have a wonderful role here because uh, uh, it's going to stir up a big fuss. And um, if WHO gets out in front and offers some guidelines that would say, here's, here's a, a decent way of getting around some of these uh, uh, obstacles or questions, and uh, you know, in our view, any, any laboratory that follows the following guidelines should be regarded as having a safe harbor. If WHO does that, then it can avoid what could be years of needless controversy and, and misunderstanding. And I was just completely full of it. I mean, I just thought this is, this is a wonderful opportunity for a rather stodgy UN agency to be way out in front before anyone's ever heard of it. And they said, STEM what? <laughs> Wisconsin? You know. Forget it. I was whistling into the wind. It was years before, before I mean, they, when it was published in Science, they sort of read, oh, that's sort of interesting. But it took a long time for them to realize that this really was a big deal. And by that time, it was too late for them to do anything. And basically, yeah. What year was that? Uh, 99. It had become so politicized by, by that time that there wasn't any hope. And I, I'll tell you something uh, a little out of, uh, probably, it's probably not proper for me to say, but That'll make it all the more valuable. Um, uh, now, let's see. What I, when I tell the story, it involves Tommy Thompson. And I, I don't want to say it in a way that attributes to him things that he would disavow, because um, I don't want to put words in his mouth. So I'll just, this is just my impression of things. Uh, Tommy Thompson used to be governor of Wisconsin. And when I was working at University of Wisconsin, he was the governor of the state. Theoretically, he was my boss, although I didn't know him. And, um, so there I went, I went over to WHO, and then he left Wisconsin and became head of Health and Human Services. And in that role, he led the American delegation to the World Health um, uh, for, uh, Assembly, which is the governing board meeting of, of WHO. And since I was on the staff and an American citizen, I was invited to the American uh, consulate to meet uh, the delegation. And, um, and he was in the receiving line. So as we went down the receiving line, 
instead of handing him my WHO card, I handed him my University of Wisconsin card. And as I knew it would, his, you know, he sort of sat bolt upright and got interested. So he wanted to chat. And um, I got him to talk about stem cells a little bit. Now, when he had been in Wisconsin, he was the world's biggest backer of stem cells. He thought this was just great, although he's Catholic himself. He thought it was wonderful. Um, it was going to be the key to Wisconsin's economic development, and he wanted credit for it and couldn't stop talking about it. But when he went to Washington, of course, all bets were off. That was not, not okay. And he now is proud that he got Bush to sign on to the deal that he did, but he couldn't go any further than that. So I still, I wanted to get to him about this idea of a safe harbor. And now I'm just going to tell you my impression of what, what he was saying in response. It, he, he did find a chance to talk to me privately later. And the message I got from that was that um, even though he was a, a member of the cabinet, uh, he was being supervised. And that if he gave any signal that he was conniving with a, a WHO official for anything like this, don't go home. So it's just not something he could do. So he was trying. I, th I think he was trying. And um, you know there were people with names like Rove and so on, I'm sure, who, who had much more power than he did. And the rest is history, although history isn't finished being written yet. Now, um, so I'm not going to talk further about that, because in my, in my view, the, the, the chance for international cooperation and, and understanding and agreement and condominium and so on, uh, the chance for that basically was over once this once it's got a political tailwind and certain parties decided that they could make hay uh, politically by by using this issue and then you can kiss um, uh, uh, agreements goodbye. So instead, I'm going to change gears entirely and instead of talking about the chance to overlook differences and so on and negotiate, which I don't think is really possible given the political axes that are being ground on this issue. Instead, I want to give a reason to argument, not a chance to overlook differences, but a chance to appeal to commonalities. And I want to share with you uh, an argument that I've developed, um, although never published, uh, that could be offered as in the form of a letter to a friend who is on the other side of the ideological divide on the status of embryos. So imagine that the presentation I'm about to give addresses somebody in this group who considers himself or herself to be a right to lifer. Now, I'm not addressing this to <clears throat> a leader of the right to life forces. It's not to James Dobson. And it's also not somebody who's a professor of this stuff, who's got you know, very sophisticated and articulate and consistent views. I'm talking about the rank and file, the people whose, whose votes and votes matter and whose feet are, are marching on election day and, and, and who, whose support is essential if the, if the opposition to embryo research is to succeed. And my claim is that if they think deeply and carefully, they'll switch sides. Now, uh, I, I've tried this argument on many of them. And if you want to know later how many, what percentage I've converted, I'll tell you, but uh, I'm not offering this as a sales technique. I'm offering it as a, as a logical argument. What I want to show is that the rank and file in the right to life movement, and I mean people who you know, not, not just have passive beliefs, but are actually out there picketing abortion clinics and so on, that the rank and file has more reason to support embryo research than to oppose it. Now, the, the way I'm going to argue this is this, I'm, I'm going to talk about certain beliefs that they typically have. And I, my claim is going to be that if you take those beliefs as a given, I mean, you start with those beliefs, just accept them as premises, that the position on embryo research that fits best is the one that's more typical in this room than the ones that their leaders are advocating. And so you have an army out there whose leaders really don't have the same uh, a position on the crucial issue, which is basically whether killing an embryo uh, is uh, something as wrong as killing a child or an adult, which is really what it all comes down to, I think. So again, just let me, let me outline the structure of the argument. I'm going to point to some beliefs that they now have, these 
the rank and file and the right to life movement, beliefs that they widely share. And we're going to try to show that from these beliefs, one can argue a, a, a positive position on embryo research follows much better than opposition to it, although this would be the last thought that would ever occur to most of them. So what are these beliefs? Let me start with one that um, is, is rather easily misunderstood, but I think it's, a, it's an important uh, uh, premise anyway. You all know that a high percentage of eggs that are fertilized spontaneously abort. What percentages do you estimate? 30, I hear. Any others? 80? Yeah, okay, so somewhere between 30 and 80. Why this should be such a mystery at this point amazes me, but anyway, there we go. So somewhere between 30 and 80 percent of all fertilized eggs spontaneously abort. Uh, now, this is not a crime. This is, just a, this is just a fact of nature. That's just the way it is. But we can ask a question about the reaction of right-to-lifers to these events. Suppose, uh, to take a hypothetical, that you found out that in Missouri, uh, last year, 30 to 80 percent of all one-year-olds or three-year-olds died of some unknown cause. It was uh, just a mass die-off among children in Missouri. Um, no one would think it's a crime as long as we thought this was, you know, not something that had been done deliberately. But people would be very alarmed. Uh, probably we, we might even shed a tear, even though we didn't know any of these children. We certainly sympathize with, with, uh, with, their, with you know, the, their, their relatives and their loved ones, and we might resolve to do something about this, to investigate, find out what in the heck caused this, this, uh, this terrible, catastrophic epidemic of whatever it was that killed them, and try to make sure this doesn't happen anymore. Now, this happens every single day in the United States and every other country uh, with embryos, with fertilized eggs. 30 to 80 percent of them die. Most people don't know this, of course. But a lot of people do know this. And what is their reaction? Well, I've, I have no systematic surveys, but in my informal questioning or, or uh, exchanges with people from the Right to Life movement, it's always, well, it's sad uh, because, mostly they say it's sad because the women involved may have looked forward to getting pregnant. Of course, that's not true of all of them, but many of them perhaps that's, that is true of. But that's not the point. The point is not that the parents missed a chance to have a child. The point is a human being died. Now, if, if their view is that human life begins at the moment of fertilization and that the death of a fertilized egg at any stage of its development is as much a tragedy as it is when if, if one of us died or one of our children died, then you would, you would look for some reaction. There's no reaction whatever. I have yet to encounter anyone who has any reaction at all. And then I, I'll sometimes uh, challenge them and say, look, don't you think it should be a very high priority given that 30 to 80 percent of each generation, according to the way you define generation, is dying you know, of spontaneous deaths? Don't you think it should be a high priority for NIH to sort of shift all of its resources away from virtually everything it's doing and try to figure out how to stop this? No, not really, they say, because often the parents are unaware of it, and sometimes it's due to genetic anomalies. But look, you know, suppose that there were children dying and their parents weren't aware of it, or it was due to genetic anomalies. Would we be so complacent? Or suppose it were teenagers? Of course not. Absolutely not. So how are we to understand this lack of a reaction? The only way to understand it is that they really don't think it, that when a, a fertilized egg dies after three weeks or six weeks or 12 weeks, that this is such a big deal. Because they sure don't act like it's a big deal. That's A, okay. B, um, suppose that there is a rape and the rape results in pregnancy. Should the girl be free to have an abortion? Most state laws now say yes. I mean, the, the, uh, I mean of course, the abortion is legal anyway, but. Uh, even before that, there were exception clauses. Even before Roe v. Wade, there were exception clauses that said that rape is legal in the case of rape. Excuse me, that abortion is legal in the case of rape. And the right to lifers who I've talked to 
have generally said that they would be very uneasy about a statute that outlawed abortion, even in the case of rape. And that's a, I mean, their reasoning is perfectly sound. They say that this isn't something the woman invited, consented to, could be held responsible for. It was violently forced on her. And, and uh, it's just a question of choosing between tragic alternatives. None of, the, none of the alternatives are good, including abortion. But it would be worst of all to, f to force her to carry the, the child of, of her rapist. Well, that sounds fine. But if you think about, just for a moment, what they've just said, it doesn't compute. What they basically said is that if there's a, a child that results from a rape, you can kill him. Suppose that, that uh, somebody um, um, was raped and then not long afterward had uh, sex with their spouse. And then after the child was four or five years old, found out actually through a DNA test, it was the rapist child, and then shot the child. Would any of us think this is okay? I mean, it's, 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 it's tragic, but it's the best of a bunch of very bad alternatives. Of course not, the person would be put in jail for a long, long time. Why don't they think that about abortion in the case of rape? Because after all, if the fertilized egg has, is the same moral importance as, as you and I and our children do, that's the only conclusion you could possibly draw. But I've almost never met anybody in the right to life movement who maintains that. So it doesn't figure. Okay, that's number two. Uh, same thing for incest. I won't go through the argument. You could easily imagine it. Just because daddy forced himself on a girl and she got pregnant, does that mean it's okay to kill their child? It can't be okay if you think that that fertilized egg, that embryo, has the same rights that the rest of us do. Because the rest of us would have a right not to be killed even though we were the result of an incestuous union. Now, next case. Um, suppose there's a genetic defect. That, that there's a, a, a quite bad genetic defect that runs through the family line and the, the girls who get pregnant who are from that family live in dread that they're gonna carry such a child. They get pregnant maybe in the, in the context of marriage and then they find out that yes, it carries this defect. Now here we have to divide cases. There are some genetic defects that are so awful that we can truly say the child is better off dead. Uh, if you had a chance to live but only on the condition that you have this defect, you would turn it down, you'd rather die first. But there are many others that are extremely serious, and I, I mean way beyond Downs. They have very, very serious defects. And um, they're not so bad that you would, you would rather die first, but it's, it's fairly close. Now let's take one of those cases. In my, when I talked to Right to Life advocates and asked whether or not abortion would be justified in such a case, not all, but the majority have said they thought it would. Again, terrible outcome, but taking into account all the range of possibilities here, it's the least bad one. Well, you know the pattern of argument here. Now suppose that they waited three or four years after birth and this child was suffering, yes, but not suffering so much that death was preferable from their point of view. Can we kill a child? Of course not. So the only way to make sense of their view is that they just don't think that that fertilized egg has the same rights that you and I do. Because otherwise, they wouldn't allow the mother to kill that child or the doctor to kill that child in an abortion. It just wouldn't make any sense. Um, now, here comes one that's tough. And this is really the last in the series. Suppose you have one of these classic dilemmas where, as a result of a problem in delivery, the doctor has to choose between the life of the child and the life of the, of the fetus. You all know that in the old days, the church taught that in most cases, you had to save the child's life, even if the mother died as a result. And the classic case is where the child is, just cannot get through the birth canal, and the only way you could save the mother's life would be to crush the skull of the child, of the fetus. Uh, the church said you can't do it, even if it means that the mother's life will end. Uh, you have to try to save that child. Does anyone know what, how the church's reasoning went in that case? How did they decide that the child's life was more important than the mother's life? 
Sorry? Geography. No, I nope. What? Sorry? Nope. Nope. None of those. None of those. Mm -mm. Nope, 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 nope. But they're, 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 all these things can be added on, but the central, the central reason is... What? Nope. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. Nope. Nope, nope. Anybody, any other guesses? Nope. No, they think this is going to be the old one coming back. Um, no, all wrong, all wrong. Here's the reason. Oh, no, no, that's one thing. Second qu quiz question. Did the church say you will, must always save the life of the mother, the save the life of the fetus? Were there any exceptions? Yeah. What? And why? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah the, that is correct. There were exceptions. And the, and what were the exceptions and why? There were exceptions. What were they and why? Nope. 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 No, I already know you're wrong. Nope. Sorry. Anybody know? She's pregnant with twins. No, 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 no. Okay. Colonel Mustard in that. No. Okay. Uh, first, let's look at one of the exceptions. I think that there, this is sort of interesting. Interesting that nobody knows. I didn't know until I started looking at it. But it's instructive, as you'll see. First, the exception, ectopic pregnancy. Yeah, that was often an exception. Uh, but a second, the most revealing exception is cancer of the uterus. The mother has cancer of the uterus. If you go in there and you take out the tumor, the child has nowhere to live, it's going to die. That's okay, they said. Even though the child will die, you have an obligation to save the mother's life. That's okay. Now, why would they say that's a go an okay exception? Hmm? Nope. It's not viable. Nope. Either Sorry? Either yeah, but that's not really what it's about. What it's about is this. Have you ever heard of the doctrine of double effect? Mm -hmm. This is um, a, 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 a doctrine of Roman Catholic moral theology that plays a crucial role in this argument. And it's, um, I'll tell you what the, what the doctrine is, and then we'll apply it to this case, and then we'll see how it, how it applies to the thing we're talking about. Doctrine of double effect first starts with a distinction between things that you can foresee and intend as opposed to things that you can foresee but not intend. Now, here's a, here's a good example. Um, those of us who are old here uh, know hand signals when you drive. How many people know how to signal a left-hand turn? Okay, so let's suppose that your, your electronic signals are broken and you want to signal that you're going to do a left-hand turn. What do you do? Yes, it's like, it's, a, it's like a Nazi salute except straight to the side. Uh, yeah, if you're turning left. Now, suppose that it's raining outside, and you know it's raining outside. Then when you stick your hand out to say left turn, you foresee that your arm will get wet. Do you intend that your arm be wet, get wet? No. You know it's going to happen. But if you ask, why'd you do it, or you know, what's your intention in sticking out your arm, you're not going to say, oh, it needed wetting down. You know? <laughs> it's a signal that you, have a left, you want to make a left-hand turn. So it's a case of, a, of an effect. The wetting down of your arm is something that's foreseen, but it's not intended. Now, the doctrine of double effect says that there are some cases in which there is a harm as a result of an action of yours that may be justified even though you foresee it as long as it's not intended and certain other conditions apply. The most famous application of this apart from this abortion case is wartime. There's an ammo dump and you're fighting on the right side of a, of a war, you're, you have a just cause and in order to defeat the enemy you have to blow up this ammo dump but there are civilians in the neighborhood. Some of them are going to die if you hit the ammo dump. Can you do it? Well. There's a rule about proportionality, there's a rule about what makes for a just war, and so on. But if you satisfied all those things, the answer is yes. Because you're not blowing up the ammo uh, supply in order to kill those people. That's a foreseen but unintended result of what you do. 
Whereas if there were no ammo dump and you thought, well, let's kill some civilians and that'll demoralize the population and undermine the government and then we'll win, that would be forbidden even though your cause is just uh, in both cases, equally just in both cases. And even if, the, even if the, the strategy would be equally effective in both cases. So you get the idea. Now what's lying behind this is a doctrine that was um, a part of Roman Catholic moral theology for you know, millennia, it's, and it's thought through by brilliant people and, and refined to a uh, you know, fine edge. Um, you cannot intend evil, even though the good may come of it. That's basic, it's, Paul said that, it's a basic, basic doctrine. You cannot intend evil, even though good may come of it. Now, in the case of the ammo dump, um, if, you, if you hit it in order to, hit the, to defeat the enemy and you regret the, the uh, collateral damage to the population and you satisfy the requirements about proportionality and just war, then this is not a case of intending evil so the good may come of it. You, you do not intend evil, either as a means or as an end. But if you're demoralizing the population, you kill some civilians to, un to demoralize the population, you do intend that as a means, and you can't intend that as a means. So that's the doctrine. So the, the, the Catholic Church has an absolutist morality, and it says you cannot intend evil, even as a means, period. It's just you cannot do that. It's forbidden. But the, the doctrine of devil effect is one of several supplementary principles that they use to engage this absolutist doctrine to the problems of real life. Now, let's go back to the, uh, the uterine cancer. If you try to cure the, the woman's cancer, the baby will die. Is the death something you intend? No. Does this, is this a good thing to do to save a woman's life? Yes, it is. Is, there, is the loss proportional to the gain? Well, it's one, you know, somebody's going to die either way. So it's okay. So the church says actually you should go in there and you should let the baby die. As a result of your intervention, the baby will die, and you know that's true. It's 100% likely and you should do it. Now, why doesn't that apply to the standard case of the, of the birth canal? Because the act itself is killing it. Yes, because the only way to, to prevent the death of the mother would be to kill the child by crushing the skull, and you intend the baby's death as a means, and you can't do it. And that's the origin of that doctrine. But nor can you. No, but you're not doing that, of course. What's happening in this case is you're saving the child and the mother will die as a result. It's foreseen but not intended. Now, um, uh, this, you can see the, how elaborate this moral reasoning is. It's really not a thing of beauty, if you think moral arguments have a kind of architectural beauty, which I do. Um, it's been really, really thought out by really, really smart people. But what's the rule today? Well, even right-to-lifers who, who say that abortion should be illegal in the case of rape or genetic defect or incest will still say it's okay in the case of to save the mother's life. And they don't make a distinction between cancer of the uterus and other dilemmas, just across the board. Now, is that consistent with this reasoning? N-O, it is not. And there's no way to make it so. The underlying moral moral principle here is well, you cannot intend evil even as a means. Now, as long as you see the, the, the fetus as having the same rights as, as we do, or its death having being the same kind of tragedy as the death of one of us or one of our children would be, you're forced to this conclusion. But that's not what they say. That's not what they believe. Almost all right-to-lifers think, and even their leaders here echo this, that abortion, when you have to save, uh, do it to save the life of the mother, is okay. But it doesn't compute. Well, it doesn't compute with Catholic yeah, theology. Yeah, that's right. But it does compute with still, you can still argue that they're both lives. And if you, I mean, in strict Jewish law, it's, uh, in fact, you're, you are required by law, if the, if, the, if the child is endangering the mother, then the child is, is labeled a rodef, a, you know, someone who is chasing after you to kill you. Yes. And you're required to, actually, you're required to kill the fetus. Right. Very few of these people are Jewish. <laughs> if they were, if they were, you'd have, we could make a deal, you know, but, the, but they're not. But, but what I'm saying is, it, it, but it doesn't necessarily, mean, although many of them are Catholic, yeah. you can still say yeah. that if they had a lives without, you, you, yes. have a, you can have a 
No, your, your point is very well taken. If, if, if you could reconstruct this according to a very different way of looking at moral choice. In and a so way that they're both yes, nice. yes, you could, you could. The, class, the, the standard Catholic way of doing it does not allow this exception, but right to lifers who subscribe to Catholic Roman, uh, Roman Catholic moral theology do make this exception. Now, take this whole list of, of exceptions. Why, uh, why it's okay to do things that cause deaths of fetuses or, em or embryos? How does what kind of pattern does this make? What, what, what should we conclude about what these people believe about embryos and fetuses? That they think that it's just as great a tragedy when an embryo or fetus dies as it is if we died or one of our kids died? I can't, it just doesn't, doesn't compute. It makes no sense. The only thing that makes sense is that they think it's a tragedy, but not quite the same tragedy. Or they think it's a tragedy, especially for a, a later term fetus. But if it happens, you know, the first two or three weeks when parent is even unaware of it, then it's mostly a tragedy for the parent who might have wanted to have a child, same way any of us would think about it. it just, but if you, if you ascribe to them the belief they claim to have, which is that embryos are people from the moment of conception, and that it's just as great a tragedy if life is lost at that point as any other point in the lifespan, and they have the same rights that we do, then none of this would make any sense. They would all have to be extremists on Every, every one of these issues. Now, you can say, well, they probably do believe this, but they know that it wouldn't you know, sell. Well, that's not my experience in talking to them. When, you know, as far as I can tell, the people who I've talked to, not, not any kind of scientific sample, but I've, I have had the advantage of talking for hours. Um, so I, I do think they're being totally sincere with me. Um, they haven't thought it through, really. Uh, they, they, they will still insist that you're a, home, uh, you're a human being from the moment of conception. But then they endorse all these exceptions. So a few of them have been patient enough to allow me to spell all this out, you know. And not one of them has been able to wriggle out of this. Because you can't. You just can't. So what do you do? Well, uh, what they used to do is they would realize they, they were wrong to make any exceptions. So they would snap back into line. And when I said I'm, I'm addressing this to the rank and file, the reason I said that was that the leadership, presumably, is not afraid to, in their, in their moments of total candor, take the hard line, and they are presumably aware of the need to in order to be consistent. Because the, what they can't give up is this premise that from the moment of conception, um, embryos are just as much people as you and I. They can't give, if they give that up, all the rest is gone. So they're never going to give it up. And it, for them, giving up the exception on a, the, the, the right to have an abortion after, after rape or in the case of a threat to the mother's life is peanuts compared to that. But that's not true for the rank and file. Ask members of the rank and file, if you know them, um, what would you think about a statute that banned abortion even in the case of uh, loss of the mother's life or rape or you know, any of these other things? And I'll be amazed if you find any who say, well, I think that's OK. If you, to be consistent, we have to say that, that's OK. So when I talk to them, what, what, they never switch over, I'll just confess it. Um, but it does put them in a period of, into a state of puzzlement, because they don't have an answer. And now, now what? So it is a big problem for them, and it should be a problem. Now, m my own claim here, it's not one that I've gotten any of them to endorse, but my own claim is that um, although they've always interpreted their, or they've always sort of understood their, their beliefs as having as its centerpiece this premise that embryos are people like you and I. They don't really believe it. The, 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 if you take the whole web of belief and you try to, you try to make sense of their web, of their, the, the panoply of their beliefs in its entirety, only the premise that, that embryos, while human, of course they're human, are not people like you and I, that's the only belief that makes sense of the rest of their beliefs. So that's when I say this is an appeal to the rank and file. What I mean is I would like them to see how things that they already believe assume that what their leaders want them to insist on isn't true in their own eyes. Not anybody else's eyes, but in their own eyes. Now, what kind of argument is this when, I, when these are people active in the right to life movement and sort of the, the slogan of the right to life movement is that human beings are people from the moment of conception. 
And I'm saying, you don't really believe that. Why don't you just draw that premise? Mm -hmm. um, well, you could say it's arrogant. I mean, who am I to tell them what they believe? But it, it's not me. It's, it's, a, it's some arguments, and they should take the arguments seriously. If they can't answer the arguments, then if they're morally serious people, which almost all these people are, then they, have to, they just have to think it through. And so um, it's just like when talking with, you know, I grew up in the South, and I talked to racists a lot because I was surrounded by them. And um, they would, when we talked about black-white differences and whether blacks had the same rights as whites did, they always came up with all these arguments about you know, black-white natural differences. So they, clearly they were premised on the idea that blacks are not as smart as whites or whatever it is. And when you came up with, if you, if you force them to focus on this, they would finally admit that, yes, that is what they're raising this on. And if it turned out that that wasn't true, they should give up those attitudes. Now, if suppose I brought along 20 biology books and disproved every one of those beliefs, they would still, they would still have an animus against blacks. That's why you know, there, there are very few black dentists outside of black communities because whites don't like having black fingers in their mouths. Um, and these people you know, would have been revolted by the idea, and no, no number of biology books would have changed that. That's just the kind of attitude that they had. But nevertheless, if they were morally serious people, then it would be incumbent on them to say, look, I, I, I still have these feelings, but I admit that I can't square it with these arguments, and I just have to think about it. And that's what I would expect from a right to lifer. I do expect of the right to lifers when I present this series of arguments. And some of them do go away a bit puzzled. Now, on occasion, one of them will say, look, um, I don't have an answer to these arguments, but I'm not going to give up this central belief that you want me to give up. So I'm just going to take this hard line that you're talking about. So I, I say, OK, now that means I want to see some tears about all these spontaneous abortions. And I want you writing letters to the president urging NIH to shift money out of cancer and mental health into preventing spontaneous abortion the first three to six weeks of pregnancy. And they say, I will. <laughs> one time I, I, I saw him again. I said, have you? Uh -uh. So, you know, I, I think they did mean it at the time because they saw that the, they had to say it. They had to say that or else they have to say, I'm not really very morally serious. And they, they were morally serious. So they had good intentions at the time, but they didn't do anything about it. And what that shows me, it shows to me, I think, is they didn't really believe that thing, although they, they were very attached to the idea that they do. Well, would you, it, would, would you um, how many percent, what's the percentage of people who are 100 years old that die every year? Um, well, actually, longevity increases the older you get. <laughs> you know, the, 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 if you want to find the people with the longest life expectancy, um, go to an old folks' home. Less, less than 50% is the answer. Less than 50% will die. Right. But greater than 30%, 20%? A, a yeah. greater percentage of people, there is, there is, a, there is a year. Yeah. What, my my I mean, point is this. People who are aged of 100, um, they're going to die in the next year. A few of them will die in the next year. Surprisingly few. But a uh, surprisingly Obviously. large number will die in the next 10 years. Yes, they will. Yes. That's <laughs> why <laughs> <laughs> a large number will die in the next 10 years. So what if you found out that every, you know, every 10 years, like, you know, 100% of the people who are 100 yeah. are dying? Yeah. You wouldn't shed a tear for them either because, no. because the, and, and why? Because you would say, this is the natural nature. This yeah, is the, the far from it. You would say this is these are the most fortunate people who ever lived. But you would also you wouldn't you would you wouldn't send out special you know letters to the president. But you know what? When a three year old dies, you do. When a three year old dies, you yeah. do. And even if it happened for natural causes that could not have been averted, they had a genetic defect and you found out about it, or there was an epidemic you couldn't prevent, you would shut it here, wouldn't you? And it's because they only live three years. When a hundred when a centenarian dies, you say it's sad that they're gone. We love them. But, but, but you say, say boy, 100 years, all. great. But those who haven't lived at all, would you share a tear necessarily? I don't know that it's necessarily. Well, probably somebody in the room has had a baby die, uh, a stillbirth or had a, had a or death occur in the first year. And, and it hasn't happened to me, but it has happened to people I know. And yes, it's a terrible experience. So uh, it's the thought that this young life, full potential, uh, is never going to have a life. And that's terribly sad. Now, why don't we have it about embryos that wash down the the tubes, and, and we don't because, guess why? 
Mm -hmm. There's only one explanation, I think. Mean. Yes? Dan, I've always, wondered, I've always thought, and I just want to play devil's advocate mm -hmm. I've always thought that one of the reasons that people become focused on the fact that every fertilized egg has value mm -hmm. is that the counter argument to that, that this is entirely a woman's choice, seems too cavalier. Mm -hmm. That to make a fertilized egg not valuable at all is very repugnant to these people. Okay, but that's not the view I've attacked. What I've attacked is a view that, that has the same value as the rest of us have. But their view, I think, in hanging on to how important the fertilized egg is, mm -hmm. might stem partly from the fact that there's a whole group of people that are treating it very cavalier. It might, it might, but I'm, I'm addressing one one particular belief, which is that at, as soon as a, a fertilization occurs, this is a, a human being with the same rights, the same importance as the rest of us. Right. Now, the view that, that it's now human and so it has a more importance than it did when it was a sperm and an egg or more than a rock is one that's shared by a lot of people who think of themselves as poor choice. And so that's why you know a, a lot of people who would never think of themselves as pro-life would still want some kind of special regulations about how embryos should be should be handled. And so that's just not uncommon to find. You've, there's a division of opinion. Right. But that puts them in the other side of the of the divide, right. if they accept that view. Right. But I've always felt that part of that polarization was because the other polarized side is, is more cavalier than anybody's comfortable with also. Some aren't, some aren't, you know. Uh, the, the caricature of the, right, of the pro-choice person is, but many pro-choice people aren't. Right. So that's part of it. Now, I, in, in fact, I think, it seems to me that, that this issue is demagogue beyond recognition and that the, the desire to take up this uh, confusion or this sympathy toward the idea that fertilized eggs are people like you and I, the idea to, to loft that up to the level of principle and make it the central issue of American politics is, is just a, a, a passing temporary fact about how to, about the desire of some people to meld together a coalition that's allowing a lot of their allies to do things that they want to do and they couldn't otherwise do. So in other words, some people have a big stake in fanning this, this idea and making sure that for a lot of people it's the only thing that they think about. Um, I was just uh, uh, talking with a, a colleague uh, this week about the fact that, the, the, in wonderment, that uh, that the, the obsession with the with this part of the right wing on the status of embryos, strangely enough, has caused a counter reaction so that there are people who basically should have more interest in social security and so on, but for them the only thing they think about is the same issue on the other side, of course. And so uh, the idea that someone like Harry Reid, who's now the Senate Minority Leader, uh, should be regarded as a good Democrat even though he's pro-life is anathema, and that, that, that any senator who would ever vote to confirm um, a, a, a Supreme Court nominee who would not support Roe v. Wade, that that's absolutely out, you should make sure they're defeated in the next primary and all this stuff. It's just the mirror image you know, on, the, on the other side, and it's a very strange moment in American politics where this question about embryos has, for many people on both sides of the issue, displaced everything else in this time of where so many issues are so important, but that's personal appraisal. But um, the, the, the main point I'm trying to, uh, just to repeat the, the earlier one, is that um, I don't know whether there would be any, any actual gain by strenuously addressing this kind of argument to the rank and file of the, of the pro-life movement. Um, I, I would think so, partly because I'm, I do it in all sincerity. Uh, what, what I try to do when I offer these arguments is to show that, first of all, I take their view very seriously to the point where I have to actually tell them, you know, reconstruct their view for them, especially this double effect thing. And um, that is a sign of respect. I'm not doing it just to, so I can stomp their views into the ground, but instead, you know, to see whether or not there's something in there that I might agree with uh, and whether or not I've missed something. And I would think they owe me the same respect from my point of view. So just the attempt might be might have a salutary effect. But the main thing is that by engaging in people who are on the side of, of what I think is rather blind rejection of embryo research, engaging them in this kind of dialogue is already raising the, the, uh, the exchange to the level of rational argument, where it usually isn't. And that can't be a bad thing either. Yeah. How do you, how 
would you expect this, the person who believes that life is indeterminate, how would you help them handle having to fertilize an egg to create a specialized stem cell for some particular reason? Um, well, it, I think, don't think it's that hard. The first thing to do is to go, go through all this stuff and ask them to reflect on whether they think fertilized eggs really are people like you and I. Now, given the other things that I think that they'll be ready to agree to, the answer cannot be yes. Now, suppose they say, well, all right, not people like you and I, but nevertheless, human and you know, um, holy and you know, beloved by God and, and special in various ways. Well, as I say, there are a lot of pro-choice people who believe some version of that. So um, you might agree that you would never, you would never casually destroy an embryo. Uh, that when you handle an embryo, you do it in a manner that's in keeping with its uh, its significance and moral significance, if you share that view. But still, when you put it on the scale with the potential that experimentation on embryos might have for for relieving suffering. For children and adults in the future, um, you know there is it is appropriate to, to see what the where the heaviest weight is. So in this way, it's different from absolute rights. Suppose that you said, look, um, if if uh, the doctors could just grab you, Wickler, and torture you and then kill you and dismember you, they can come up with a cure for cancer. Now, surely relieving cancer for all those people in the world would justify that, don't you agree? Um, well, I might, apart from the fear I have, I might say, <laughs> no, you know, it's, it's, it, my life it, I, is not something you can put on a balance scale. You just, you can't kill me. You just can't do it. So that's, that's an absolute. So if that's where we are, then you can't do this kind of research. But if, you, if my argument is successful, then you'll get, you, you will not be there anymore. The death of an of embryo is just not the same kind of event as the death of one of us. And even killing an embryo isn't the same event as killing one of us. It just isn't. And so now the balance scale is wheeled out, and we may disagree over how much weight it has and what it would take to make the scales tip the other way, but we're engaged in the same kind of haggling, and there's some possibility of agreement. I, I, yes. I've been very interested in what you said, and I think there is a slight difference between right-to-life people in this country and right-to-life people um, in the UK. Because I think right-to-life people here uh, are more concerned with the rights of the woman in the abortion example that you've mentioned. Right-to-life people are. The right-to-life people are. Uh -huh. So I think the exceptions uh, for abortion and the right-to-life of a fetus that you've mentioned would not weigh so heavily uh, okay. in my country. Mm. So as far as I'm concerned, forget about abortion. Uh, I find that not a helpful argument. I see, yeah. Now, I, I, but it, I, what yeah. percentage of, your, of, uh, of the British are right to lifers, do you think? Very few. Ah, so. 10% uh, uh, OK, so if you took the 10% here, okay. the core, you probably have the same Mainly strict Roman Catholics. Yes, okay. Here, right. it's a much wider yes. area, so I hesitate. Yes, exactly. There you are. Okay. But I think it is similar in the early, the embryo mm -hmm. argument, which I've been more involved with. Mm -hmm. And I think you're absolutely right there. And I think one can make a lot of headway there, because although, you know, probably a number of women in this room have had spontaneous abortions at three months or more, and it's been very sad and one's regretted it deeply. <coughs> On the other hand, there are many women in this room who have had unprotected sex and then had a period, so the products of conception, mm -hmm. if there have been any, have been lost, mm -hmm. and they have not thought too much no. about it. No. No and does. if you talk to Roman Catholics, they have never considered wanting to give Christian burial to the possible products of conception yes. in that situation. Indeed, they're rather embarrassed at even the thought of it. Yes. <laughs> so they clearly yes, do not and that is a puzzle, consider that very seriously. Yes. 
so they have an out though. That's right. That's right. What's their out? Um, I, I'm not Catholic, and so I hesitate to speak uh, about what the true Catholic position is, but here's my understanding of it. The true Catholic position is not that life begins at conception. Although, my guess is most Catholics think that is the true position. Does anyone know what the true Catholic position is? It's when the embryo is infused with blood. No. Uh, no? No. 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 Heartbeat? No. Twinkle in the eye. No. No. The, the official view is that it is a mystery, and we have no amount of idea. Uh, so then, why? Uh, so why then? Why then is abortion wrong? The reason is that it may have occurred at conception, for all we know. And so, to be casual about the death of a fetus, to kill uh, a fetus as in an abortion, is to act regardless of human life. And that is a crime right next to. I mean, it's wrong, as wrong as killing. It's like shooting into a bar when there may be kids playing in there who would be killed by your bullet. You just can't do it. But it's not, it's not that they claim to know when God infuses the developing embryo with life. That's a, a, a one of the great mysteries. So, even so, even so, accepting that, if they believe there was a possibility that the products of conception were being lost, yes. They should be given Christian right. burial. Yes. And if one talks to uh, an intelligent Jesuit, so most Jesuits are very intelligent, uh, you can have a very good argument along those lines. And what, why do they, how do they defend not burying them? Huh? How do they defend not failing to bury them? Uh, well, um, very often you can distinguish between uh, the uh, the uh, genetic individuality that begins at fertilization and the uh, individual uh, which begins later ah. at, the at the end of implantation. So until the embryo is implanted, there is a certain, mm. certain ambiguity, ambiguity which would cover that, that case. Um, these are these are not standard issues. These are not standard issues, yeah. uh, but of course the uh, Roman Catholic Church, and I've established this, regards IVF as ethically unacceptable. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Any yeah. IVF is ethically unacceptable, and yet many good Catholic women, good Catholic couples, go in for IVF. As they do abortion. As they do abortion. In fact, as they do Catholic and contraception. Women. Catholic, well, Catholic, yeah. self identified Catholic women. The thing that I have to say about IVF, that when I was working on stem cells, um, I thought, okay, the main objection that's going to be raised about stem cells is that you have to kill some, some, some embryos in order to get these stem cells. But then I thought, okay, there are thousands and thousands of embryos killed every year in IVF clinics. And no one says anything about that anymore. So no one who is not upset about what IVF clinics do would have any reason I could ever think of to be upset about stem cells. So I gravely underestimated the potential for stem cells to become a big ethical issue. Because at the time, I mean, I think there are some interesting issues now with, which I'm, you know as well as I do. They have to do with sort of the, the far reaches of experimentation. but. Certainly in the first few years of stem cells, the only, real, the only issue really was that you had to kill some embryos to get stem cells. And given that we, we were killing far more through the standard operation of IVF clinics, which are widely accepted, how could anyone object? Unless they also objected to the IVF clinics, which very few people did. Now what happened was uh, the press kept referring to the, the serious ethical issues raised by stem cells. And I would read that and think, why do they? What, you know, I would ask my colleagues, could you tell me what is the serious ethical issue with stem cells? It can't be that you had to kill some embryos because you know, the IVF clinics do that much more. And no one could ever tell me. And so for years, you know, I, I, would, I would look at these newspaper accounts about these serious ethical issues and I'd think, what are they talking about? Sometimes I'd ask a reporter, I'd say, what are you talking about? They didn't, weren't able to really tell me, apart from the fact that you had to kill some embryos. 
it's, it's so what this indicated to me was there was a very big blast of political agenda here that lofted this thing and used it as a as a means toward a certain political end. And but for that, if if the if the politicians if all politicians had said, look, for people who are upset about IVF, you'll be upset about this too, and for the same reasons, although not to the same extent. And no one else should bat an eye. If they'd said that, my guess is the public would have said, oh, stem cell. But that's not what happened. There's an interesting view about stem cells that I've heard put forward by a patient, which is that any embryo has a unique genetic identity established at fertilization. If that embryo dies, that genetic identity is lost forever and ever, which is perhaps tragic. Yes, I think that's, I mean, I think but, one can imagine a, a feeling where it's for that reason, yeah. yes. But if stem cells are made, that particular genetic identity goes on indefinitely, mm. as long as the stem cells go on. That unique genetic identity is still there. And I have heard an IVF patient who was donating embryos express and this mortality. that she would much rather have her embryo with its unique genetic identity go on indefinitely, and maybe those cells will help somebody someday or whatever, rather than simply get flushed down or whatever. criteria that IVF labs use to simply set up what should stay in the freezer and what should be uh, discarded. Uh, and I would suspect that the, the extremes right wing, you're never going to satisfy them no matter what criteria is used. I mean, I think there will be a certain moral outrage by certain sets of music if they realize for one second that the thousands and thousands of embryos that are just routinely discarded across this country by subjective criteria. They are, they are, there's no measure in terms of the, the viability or the vitality of those embryos. It's purely subjective. Uh, but they, they would be upset even if it weren't subjective as long as you were destroying embryos. Oh, no, no, that, that's, that's exactly that's yeah. what exactly, but, but I don't think that the general public realize yeah, in, in general just exactly how many embryos on a routine basis are discarded uh, every day yeah. uh, through IVF clinics. No, absolutely um, not. The other thing I wanted to make, and I, I'm sure John could probably correct me far better here, uh, because he studied this, this topic, and that is, I think, isn't usually the word conception was used because of, because of the uncertainty about when life begins, it's not. Well, conception's an old medieval word that means acceptance into the womb. And uh, <coughs> this was Sir Thomas Aquinas used it in that sense, and the words anima, animatus and inanimatus, all that came in. It was, <coughs> it was in I think it was in 1863 that Pope Pius IX abolished all that, and it said life begins at conception. But you're right, it was a myth. They didn't know what conception meant in, scientifically because fertilization wasn't discovered until eight years later. Yeah, well, he's, yeah, so, he had a special advisor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But I think that is true that the Catholic Church, that there was that decree by in the, at that time. Yeah, they have talked that way, yes. And, and that has not been changed. So when you say that it's something that None of us know. You know if, if yes. It's bigger than Catholic Church. I don't think that's what's. No, I think no question that the popes have said this. Well, they said it begins at conception. But Catholic moral theologians have said, have said this is for the public to understand. The other thing is very difficult. What the pope meant was that it's a great mystery, and so we have to act as if this are true. But as I say, I'm not. I can't speak with any authority on that. Thank you very much. My pleasure.